Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 17 through 20 say the following. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is, it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Now I want to speak for a few minutes from the subject, an anchor in the storm, an anchor in the storm. We are living in stormy times. Everything is up for grabs. The, 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 the principles, the ideals that stabilize a society and create the cohesion that my organization is trying to bring about are all under question. I mean, my good, we're at a point now where we're being told, even by Supreme Court justices, that we don't really know what a woman is or what a man is. I mean, you would think common sense would say, point to yourself, you're a woman. But no, I don't know, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> I mean, the most fundamental idea of truth, without which you can't really navigate life, is under question. There's not the truth, there's, well, there's your truth and my truth. I mean, Jesus dealt with that with Pilate. When Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus said, for this cause I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. All who are of the truth hear my voice. Remember what Pilate said? Same thing leftists are saying today. What is truth? Romans chapter 1 describes perfectly where we are. Being filled with all unrighteousness, beginning at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That last phrase suggests the celebration of sin. Look, we know in our country as well as around the world, people have always sinned. They've sinned since the fall. But we're living in an era now in, in, in our own country where sin is being celebrated now. It's not enough that people believe the killing of an unborn baby is okay, but they want to celebrate it. Shout your abortion, we're told. And it's not enough that people want to engage in all kinds of strange practices, but they want to punish anybody who doesn't agree and suggest that there's something wrong with you. If you have an objection to a preschool child being told that their gender is not fixed biologically and genetically, there's something wrong with you for raising the issue. And in, as you all know, in some states, they're even going to the position now where they are taking custody away from parents who will not engage in what's called gender affirming care. I mean, we have lost our minds. And in a country, in a country that is steeped in Christian idea and thought, and yet all of that is being thrown out. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And that's what we've got now. The truth is being suppressed. I was sharing with your pastor, YouTube told me that they won't monetize my YouTube channel because my content is harmful. It's not pornographic, it's not profane, it's, I'm, I don't, I, I, I always speak against violence, but somehow telling the truth according to the word of God is harmful. This is idolatry. People basically want to be their own God. And the and songwriter said, in times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need an anchor and we need to be sure and very sure that our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. 
Yes, he's the one. So I want to share just several things with you that will help you anchor in the storm. First, know this, God knows what we're going through. I think sometimes when Christians don't see immediate dramatic action by God to deal with the, with the wickedness in the world, that they think, well, you know, God is somehow not fully aware, not fully cognizant of, of what we are dealing with. But the Bible makes clear that it, it is not that God doesn't see, doesn't know, doesn't fully understand. Jesus was troubled by the things that he saw in his day. But it's that God says he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that, sh that all should come to life. That's what he's doing. He's trying to give human beings an opportunity to hear and respond to the truth. Thank God he's patient. He was patient with us because unlike some people I've heard speak, I, I wasn't always saved. And I'm so glad that God gave me an opportunity to come to know him and to renounce the life that I lived before my salvation. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 say, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus knows what we're dealing with. He knows the parking lot temptation. Yeah. <laughs> He understands it all. So don't ever think that God is somehow sitting back, not fully cognizant of what we're dealing with. Jesus fully understands what we're dealing with. But he said this in that same passage in Hebrews 16th verse, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And then secondly, God wants to help us. God wants to help us. He has the power and he wants to help us. You know, 10 years ago, I had a desmoid tumor. Now, some of you, perhaps all of you have never heard of it because they're fairly rare, very rare. They're, they're aggressive, malignant uh, fibromatoses and they start localized and they just continue to grow. And so I had a little one and I got diagnosed and they took it out and I figured that was the end of that. And it came back with a vengeance. Got to the point where it was the size of a grapefruit on my chest. In fact, I had to wear oversized shirts trying to hide it from people. And finally, after giving me all kinds of chemotherapy, and you'll, you'll love this one, one of the drugs they tried on me uh, started destroying the melanin in my skin. You know, my wife looked at me one day and my wife said, you know what, I think you're getting lighter. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, I'm not getting lighter. I said, it's the summertime uh, or it's the winter time. And you know, I, I, I always lighten up in the winter. And, the, and then one day I was washing my hands and looked at my hands and my fingers were lighter. And I thought, what is going on? And, and believe me, when you're a black conservative, the last thing you need is somebody thinking you're lightening your skin. <laughs> Listen, you haven't lived until you've been called a black, white supremacist. <laughs> I, f I finally went to the doctor and, and, and asked the doctor, you know, well, what do we, he said, well, I'll tell you what we've got, what we've come to. So we're gonna have to take out all the ribs on your right side. And we're gonna have to take skin grafts from the rest of your body to put some skin on fiberglass ribs that we're going to give you. I said, well, what, how long is that going to take? And he said, it's gonna be about a 12 hour operation. I said, well, what would my health be like afterwards? He said, well, it's gonna be sufficient, uh, significantly diminished, but I mean, you, you'll be okay. I, and look, I'm a man of faith. You could ask, well, had you been praying about this? Yes, but not that seriously, because you know, we Americans are so accustomed to medical science being able to answer so many questions and deal with so many issues that we just kind of take it for granted. So I wasn't trying to, to not talk to God about it. It was just that I figured, okay, this is a medical problem. We'll deal with it. And then I got hit with this and had to ask God to forgive me that I, I, I had not really taken it seriously enough. I said, Lord, what, what, what am I going to do? He's, I, said, I asked the doctor, said, if I don't have the operation, what's going to happen? He said, it's going to kill you. I didn't even tell my wife that. She found out about that later. So I went home and talked to God. The Lord said, don't have the operation. I, I'm going to heal you. And look, don't, don't do this on a lark. 
I knew that I knew that God had spoken to me. I went back to the doctor, told the doctor, I said, well, I'm not having the operation. He said, well, it's gonna, probably going to kill you. I said, have you ever seen it go away? He said, no. In fact, I, I wish I could describe to you the look he gave me when I asked that. Because it was like, who is this nutcase? <laughs> but you know what? I went back and began to pray and take authority over that thing and say, God, you gave me these ribs. I was born with them. I'm going to leave here with them. And I'm believing for your healing. And that thing started to shrink. And, and... <laughs> I went back to the doctor and I said, it's gone. He, he gave me another one of those strange looks and said, well, we better, we better do some testing. And I said, sure. He said, he took, gave me an MRI, looked at it and said, you know, it's gone. He said, but there's a little line like somebody went in and took it, took it out. And I said, somebody did. <laughs> It was the Lord God Almighty. Listen, God loves you. God has the power to help you. I don't care what the problem is. I don't care how intractable it may seem. We look at the problems in our country today and wonder, Lord, how in the world are we going to deal with it? God is on the throne. He sits high. He looks low. He's aware of what we're facing. And God is going to deal with the situation. Just like he dealt with my tumor. We got a tumor in our country right now. A tumor of sin. A tumor of evil. A tumor of wickedness. A tumor of idolatry. A tumor of godliness. Godlessness. But God is going to take that tumor out. I've got news for you. <laughs> Psalm 91 says that we who dwell in the secret place of the Most High abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We can say of the Lord, he is our refuge, our fortress, our God, in him we will trust. Surely he will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He will cover us with his feathers under his wings. We shall take refuge. His truth shall be our shield and buckler. We shall not be afraid of the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that walks in darkness or the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it will not come near us. Only with our eyes will we behold and see the reward of the wicked. For he shall give his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. They shall bear us up in their hands lest we dash our feet against the stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the cobra. We shall trample underfoot because we set our love upon him. Therefore, he will deliver us. He will set us on high because we have known his name. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor us. And with long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. That's the word of God. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. And by the way, I don't mind saying that's true regardless of the complexion of your skin. And all of these people run around telling us what you can't do and what they don't believe you can, you can do and what you shouldn't be able to do and that we ought to be divided against each other on the basis of our skin color. I quote Acts 17, 26. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. I am not here because of slavery. You are not here if you're Irish because of a potato famine. If you're Italian, you are not here because of a pogrom. We are here by appointment of Almighty God. God brought us together as a nation. care what you look like, where your ancestors came from, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he rose on the third day with all power in his hands, if you've accepted him as your Lord and your Savior, you are my brother, you are my sister in Christ Jesus, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in all and over all and through all. We are one family and one body in Christ. Jesus. And he 
is going to help us because he loves us. He loves us. I was born into a broken home. Somebody asked me earlier, how did you end up in foster care at the age of 14 months old? My father was still in my life, decided he could not take care of me. My mother was off doing other things. She'd become a Jehovah's Witness and, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, need, need I say more? Um, and and uh, I ended up in foster care. Uh, a wonderful but, but semi-illiterate illiterate couple. My foster father, Willie Molette, couldn't read at all. He made, made an X. My foster mother could read a little bit and could write her name, but she was not literate. Uh, and I w was raised with them until I was 10 years old. And by the time I was 10, I was a gang member. I was a ne'er-do-well. I was a truant. I was a juvenile delinquent. Uh, I, I, was, I, I was into some bad stuff already at the age of 10 years old. And I was on my way to either jail or an early death. We were already having gang fights. We just weren't using guns or knives at that point. But we were having some very, very vicious fights. And we were using other things to try to hurt each other. And one day... When I was 10 years old, my father pulled up on a street corner where I was hanging out with my gang and pointed his finger at me, summoned me to his car, and I walked over. He said, son, you still want to live with me? You, say you, always, you always say you want to live with me. Well, I've been clamoring for this. Why, why can't I live with my parents? Why, why, why don't my parents care about me? Why, 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 aren't, why don't they love me? And I, I just wouldn't listen to my foster parents because I felt like, well, if my parents are here to tell me what to do, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I said, yeah, Dad, I want to come live with you. He took me in his car, took me to the foster home, and announced categorically that he was taking me away. And my foster mother just went hysterical. But after all the tears and all the crying and all the, the arguing, you can't do it, he put me in his car, took me to live with him, sat me down. I will never forget it. My, my father sat me down. He said, son, you've been saying you want to live with me. You are now with me and nobody's going to take you away. He said, and every day with me can be like a day of heaven on earth or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> I found out he meant it. But I went from being an F student failing out of fifth grade to being an A student in sixth grade. I went from being the child in an illiterate foster home to going on to Harvard Law School. It was not because of a government program. It was not because of some affirmative action. It was because I had a daddy who cared enough about me to inject himself into my life and give me the guidance and direction that I needed. But that was the hand of Almighty God in my life. God saw and heard my father's rudimentary prayers. I said he wasn't saved, but he believed in God. He believed that, that God was real, that we were all accountable to him. And I really believe that God moved on him to take me out of the circumstance I was in and change the trajectory of my life. God loves us. He's going to do what needs to be done. In fact, my father's responsible more than anybody else uh, other than Jesus for my salvation because when I was in law school, I was working at Morgan Lewis and Bacchus and my, my father had gotten saved late in life. I mean, he went from being a person who simply believed that God existed to being a person who was actually submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, actually had gone into the ministry. And my father said to me, you know what I'm doing, son? I said, what? He said, I'm reading the Bible from cover to cover. I said, really? He said, yeah. And I th thought nothing of it. But on my way home, I thought, you know, I'm a Harvard intellectual. I'm reading the great books. The Bible is one of the great books. I ought to read the Bible because, you know, at cocktail parties between sips of white wine, it might come up. <laughs> I want to comment on it intelligently. I started reading the Bible from cover to cover and got to the Psalms and met this man, David. And ladies, you'll excuse me, but men, you'll understand. I was one of these stupid guys who thought that church is great for women and children, but we men have more important things to do, like sit home and watch football and drink beer. My wife would come in from church, sweet little church going girl, and come in, I'd look at her, how much of my money you give that preacher today? <laughs> and my wife would look at me and shake her head, poor thing, demon possessed right up to the eyeballs. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> but I saw David's love for God. Oh God, you are my God, early will I seek you. My flesh thirsts for you and longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. And I began to say, Lord, show me what you showed him to make him love you that way. 
And I was just praying my own prayer and on December 22nd, 1976, there's an old song that says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up, God had filled that room. He had filled my life. I knew that God was real because he was there. I walked in and tapped my wife on the shoulder. She was sweeping my son's room. I said to my wife, I said, you know what? My wife said, what? I said, I think I'm saved. <laughs> and my wife looked at, she dropped the room and said, what? I said, I don't know how to explain it. I said, but God is doing something in my life. I said, where do you go to church? I want to go to church with you on Sunday. My wife took three steps back, looked me up and said, you ain't going with me. <laughs> She called my mother-in-law and said, poor thing, Harvard Law School got to him, he had a nervous breakdown. He got up this morning talking about Jesus. But I hadn't lost my mind, I found it. I went to church that Sunday when the preacher gave the call to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I sprinted to the altar and laid there and wept as the load of sin was lifted off me. I found out that there was something more real than Harvard Law School and more real than anything else I'd experienced, and that is Jesus Christ. I found out that there's only one name given under heaven among them whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus, that every eye will behold and that every knee will bow that every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God. I found that he's bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any nation. That he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And I found out that the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. I found out that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth, seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. I found out that no weapon formed against me would prosper, that every tongue that rises against me in judgment would be condemned, because this is our heritage as children of God, and our righteousness comes from him. I found out that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Fear. The war may rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies all around me, therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare let depression or discouragement get you down. Jesus is an anchor for your soul. Don't you dare say, don't you dare say, my way is hidden from the Lord. The judgment that is due me is passed over from my God. Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, God, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength, for even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. Look, I'm 72 years old. I still got pep in my step. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I've read the back of the book and we win. Woo!